On December 2nd, 1972, Auburn met Alabama in what has become one of the most famous games in that great rivalry. For three quarters of the game, the Tigers were stymied by the Alabama defense. As the shadows lengthened at Legion Field, the situation appeared hopeless. That was until Bill Newton and David Langer pulled off one of the most amazing feats in the history of college football. They truly snatched victory out of the jaws of defeat and one of the greatest wins in Auburn history. The Auburn Tigers. Their heroics are legendary. Deep formation, handed off to Bob Gaines, the left halfback. Gaines breaks to the outside. Fredrickson gets the block, goes to the 20, to the 15, to the 10, to the 5. Touchdown, Dr. Fredrickson. And here's Sullivan, faking the Henley. Sullivan's going to go very long. Boy, Beasley, he's there. Touchdown, Auburn. Auburn going after it. Here's a good snap. It is blocked. It is blocked. It's caught on the run. Nix is going to float one for Sanders. Sanders, oh, he caught it at the two, and he died in. Touchdown, Auburn! Touchdown, Auburn! Oh, my goodness! After more than a century of highlights, championships, and breathtaking victories, still, some games stand out above the rest. These are Auburn's greatest games. Welcome to Auburn's Greatest Games. Among Auburn people, one ne only needs, say, punt, bama, punt, or 17-16, and uh, they know immediately what you're talking about. I'm Phil Snow, along with David Housel, the Auburn Athletic Director and Auburn historian. David, tell us how that team came to be known as the Amazons. They became known as the Amazons because they were simply amazing. Alf Van Hoos from the Birmingham News coined the term. I think he spelled it A-M-A-Z-I-N-S apostrophe. Not amazing, but amazings. Mm -hmm. Because it was amazing what they were able to do week after week after week. Sullivan and Beasley were gone. It was supposed to be, what, a rebuilding year? It was supposed to be a rebuilding year. And I'll never forget what our good friend Ed Shera, who was the Southeastern Sports Editor for the Associated Press, wrote in August of that season. The biggest change in the Southeastern Conference power structure this year will be the demise of Auburn. I can assure you to this day, Ed Shera still has to eat those words, the demise of Auburn in 1972. You remind him occasionally. Huh? Every time I see him, he says, I know, I know, I know, the demise of Auburn. Uh, this was a truly amazing football team. Let's get some comments from one of the uh, outstanding players on that team, Mike Fuller. It was a team that all year had, had wasn't supposed to do anything. So it was a team that had an attitude and atmosphere of, of being totally relaxed. But it had as a team that had a temperament of, I'll show you that I can. And uh, it, was as, it was a team that had a lot of people who, who knew how to cut up, but knew how to be serious. And uh, it was loose as a goose. And... Uh, people who knew that if, if, if the breaks just happened to go their way, they could win. And that had been displayed all year, and it wasn't something that uh, uh, they were ever afraid of to go out and try to do that in spite of the odds being against them. And I think it was just one of those weeks where the breaks did go their way, and so it really wasn't that big of a surprise. This was the team that was put together in, sp in the spring, wasn't it, Dave? I think you're exactly right, Phil. Coach Pat Morris, Coach Jordan's entire staff, but in particular Pat Morris, the new offensive line coach, did an outstanding job in transforming that offensive line from a line that was primarily a pass-blocking offensive line to an offensive line that was run-oriented, that blocks for Terry Henley, James Owens, and our other back. That football team was made and came together in the spring of that year. Time and time and time and time again, they would run it until they got it right. Long into the night, they would run it 
until they got it right. Uh, let's talk about coming into this game now. Auburn had a tremendous record, but Alabama was unbeaten, ranked number two in the country, a prohibitive favorite. Here again, Auburn people hoped for the miracle. They knew that Auburn had beaten Alabama in 1949, 14 to 13, when no one gave Auburn a chance. They were hoping for a miracle. Alabama's football team, their, their offensive and defensive lines was known as a Redwood Forest. Well, Auburn did a little lumberjacking that day. <laughs> <laughs> they certainly did. It didn't happen very early, though, as we well, will I, see. I think we need to go ahead and admit the truth. This was one of Auburn's greatest victories. It was not a great football game. It was an awful, boring football game for the entire game, all the fourth quarter even, until the last minute and 34 seconds. It was not a good football game. The I would ending, argue with you on that, but the last five minutes got kind of interesting. <laughs> the ending is what made it great. Okay. And all's well that ends well. <laughs> you are right about that. Let's get the, uh, some of the highlights of the first quarter of play. 1972 Legion Field. Throughout the early going, defense held the upper hand. Neither Auburn nor Alabama could muster a first down in the game's first four possessions. With 7.56 left in the quarter, Alabama took over on its own 20. On third and eight, the Crimson Tide attempted a rare pass. It was picked off by David Langer at the 35, giving Auburn great field position. Tigers also stayed mostly on the ground. Senior tailback Terry Henley shouldered the load, carrying five straight times on this possession. The drive finally stalled at the Alabama five. Gardner Jett came on to attempt a short field goal, but a bad snap ended Auburn's best threat of the quarter. Okay, uh, it seemed as though Auburn was just kind of hanging on for the first three quarters of this football game. It, that's my recollection. That was typical and characteristic of that particular Auburn football team. They would hang on and hang on and fight, scratch and claw. And uh, some way, somehow, they found a way to win. Don't you think Coach Jordan was one of the greatest underdog coaches of all time? No doubt about it. His team struck best from the underdog role. And this, is, this whole team, in particular this football game, is another example of that. Nobody believes in you. Nobody thinks you can do it. Nobody gives you any credit. Let's go out there and show them. So uh, we move now back into the uh, second quarter of play. And, uh, and, uh, and an Auburn team still doggedly hanging on, waiting for something to happen. Alabama finally got a drive going early in the second quarter. This was the era of the wishbone, and the Crimson Tides was as good as anyone's. The Crimson Tide pounded away at the Auburn defensive front. On third and four at the Auburn 20, Alabama took the inside handoff for nearly nine yards and a key first down. Finally, on third and goal from the two, Alabama took it over right guard for the touchdown. But the extra point was not automatic. As if to foreshadow what was to come, Roger Mitchell blocked the kick, and Alabama led just six to nothing. Auburn's offense continued to sputter throughout the quarter. Chris Linderman, Terry Henley, and James Owens just couldn't crack Alabama's solid defense. But 
the Crimson Tide offense fared little better against Auburn's defenders. Bill Newton, Ken Burnage, and Dave Beck led the charge. Late in the quarter, the Tigers forced Alabama to punt from its own 38. With just under three minutes left in the half, Auburn would have time for one more drive. David Langner's return set up the Tigers first and 10 at their 26 with 2.41 left. But disaster struck on the very first play from scrimmage. With time at a premium, the Tigers elected to go to the air. Sophomore quarterback Randy Wall's pass was overthrown right into the arms of an Alabama defender. He returned the interception 28 yards to the Auburn 13-yard line. An Alabama touchdown before the half would severely cripple Auburn's morale. But the Amazons would not go down easy. The defense held its ground on three straight plays, forcing the Crimson Tide to attempt a 24-yard field goal. It was good but Auburn averted disaster and trailed just nine to nothing at the half. We've all heard uh, in big games, it's the kicking game, David. Never has the kicking game, uh, the importance of the kicking game been uh, better illustrated than this game. As long as football is played in Auburn, the three words, punt, bama, punt, will emphasize the importance of the kicking game. But most people have forgotten over the years that those two punts were only two of four kicks that were blocked on that particular day. We just saw Roger Mitchell block the Alabama extra point, and we also partially blocked a third Alabama punt early in the game. So without a doubt, the football game turned on the kicking game that particular day. And that first, uh, like you say, the first blocked extra point because the final was 17-16. That was a vital part of that football game. You're exactly right, but at the half, Auburn clearly had to do something to move the football. We had eight yards rushing, eight yards total offense in the whole first half. Alabama had 112 yards total offense in the first half. Uh, they were going to be happy to win the game nine to nothing, 16 to nothing, but Auburn had to move the football to get back in the game. We thought we had to move the football, and when in reality, we just had to let Alabama have it more often and force them into punt formation more often. As we get back into the game, again, the situation was that uh, Alabama folks were waiting for the wishbone offense to explode into a big victory, but it is a victory that never came. Alabama kicked off to Auburn to begin the second half. Sophomore Mike Fuller, who would become one of the greatest return men in Auburn history, took the kickoff and returned it to the 28. The Tigers quickly discovered that Alabama's defensive front would be just as stingy as they had been in the first half. Auburn failed to get a first down and punted the ball to the Crimson Tide. Alabama took over on its own 22 after a 45-yard David Beverly kick. The Crimson Tide came out with a run as expected. But after picking up one first down, they went to the air. A costly pass interference call moved the ball into Auburn territory. Two plays later, the pass hurt the Tigers again, as Alabama gained 16 yards to the 20. Now, with the goal line in sight, Alabama went back to its strength, power running. A 16-yard run took the ball to the one. Alabama appeared to score one play later, but an illegal motion penalty took the ball back to the six. The Tide was unaffected by the penalty, 
and simply scored on a six yard run on the very next play. Alabama, after its best drive of the game, led 16 to nothing. Well, based on that 16-point uh, lead and uh, also on what the Auburn offense had been able to do up to that point, this game was over, it, it appeared. It was over. Some Birmingham radio station had picked up the Southern Cal-Notre Dame game. I believe Southern Cal was number one in the nation. Alabama had Auburn under control, 16 to nothing. Auburn had had a valiant effort. They had been uh, a game opponent for three quarters, but the game was over. People in the press box were already beginning to say, well, the tide will move up to number one, but uh, it's not over till it's over, as everyone found out that particular day. I know of uh, your great relationship with Coach Shook Jordan. Uh, do you think this was maybe his uh, favorite game of all time? He never said it was his favorite game, but I think without a doubt it was certainly his most pleasing victory. Many, many years after this, Coach Jordan would still have sideline passes from the 1972 Open <laughs> Alabama game on his desk. And people would come in and uh, he would sign one and write the score and, and give it to them as a souvenir. Uh, they actually had some reprinting, I think, so they can carry on that tradition. I don't believe any victory gave him more pleasure than this one. The only one that may have come close was the first one over Georgia Tech in 1955 that broke a winning streak. but. The climate in the state of Alabama at this particular time was such that uh, no one gave Auburn a chance, and Auburn was always playing second fiddle. And they were playing right into Coach Jordan's hands, as we talked about earlier. Uh, this game, the way it happened, the, the, the character and the, all of the intangibles he talked about so often, they all came to bear in the fourth quarter of this particular football game. This was his favorite victory, the way it happened. And it was a story that he loved to tell. We made some sort of a drive there in the fourth quarter and ended up down around the Auburn 32, I mean the Alabama 32-yard line, and it became fourth down and nine. Well, we didn't have much passing attack. Uh, our running attack, we had not gained a great de deal of yardage that afternoon, so what the heck were we going to do? We couldn't throw and we couldn't run. So uh, I called for Gardner Jet. Uh, little boy that weighed about 145 pounds. He had never kicked a field goal that long. I guess it was a shot in the dark. I remember calling Gardner over. I said, this is a little out of your range, is it, Gardner? And he said, no, sir, I can kick it. Well, uh, we made the decision to go for three. And uh, this is the only time in the history of the Auburn-Alabama series, to my knowledge, that both sides of Legion Field stood up and booed. Uh, for entirely different reasons. The Auburn crowd stood up and booed because they felt like perhaps we had quit. We felt we couldn't win the ball game. The Alabama side uh, stood up and booed because if we kicked it, that blew the line, so to speak, which was 14 points, and that would have cut it to three. <laughs> Brilliant coaching. <laughs> it, was a, it was a strange circumstance, I guess, if you were sitting in the stands wondering, what is this man doing kicking a field goal? Truth is often stranger than fiction. <laughs> but as it turned out, it worked out perfectly. So let's go back now to the uh, one of the most improbable and one of the greatest comebacks in college football in the final few minutes of a football game. Mitchell and Langer on the line of scrimmage coming from either side to try to block the kick. Auburn trying to go after it. Here's a snap. They got it. Block kick. Balls back to the 25. Picked up on the bounce at the 25-yard line. And in for a touchdown is David Langer. One blocked kick was incredible. Who would have ever thought the Amazons would do it twice? On the far right, Roger Mitchell on the left. And Auburn is again going after the kick, as you might imagine. Greg Gantz standing on his own 30. Auburn will try to block it. Auburn going after it. Here's a good snap. It is blocked. It is blocked. It's caught on the run. It's caught on the run. He's going to score. David Langner. David Langner has scored. And Auburn has tied the game. Roger Mitchell blocked the kick. The extra point was good. The Tigers led 17 to 16 and held on to win one of the most amazing games in Auburn history. 
First, David, I want to ask you where you were when the second punt uh, was taken in. I had gone down to the Auburn sideline and was standing among the football players. And as strange as it may seem, they knew. If they could ever force Alabama into punt formation, they knew they were going to do it again. It was a twilight zone of existentialism. There was no doubt in anyone's mind. Now, years and years later, well, yeah, that's how that, that's what you say now looking back. But had you been there for that instant and that moment, once Mike Neal broke through the line and, and made the tackle that set up the punting situation, Auburn players knew. Coach Paul Davis, the architect of so many great Auburn defenses, mm -hmm. and the, the person who coached the kicking game, he had found a weakness in the Alabama punt protection, obviously. But it was beyond X's and O's. This was a team of destiny, and they knew and the people around them knew that this was about to happen. It was the eeriest feeling I've had in my life mm -hmm. is being on that Auburn sideline at that particular time. And the second punt return was such a tremendous climax. The extra point, which was so vital to victory, was almost anticlimactic. Nobody really thought about the extra point. I, David Langner said in years to come, he was on the, on the bench and looked up and wondering what all the cheering was about when Gardner kicked the extra point. He thought it was tied 17 to 17. And he said, we didn't come here to tie Alabama. We came here to beat Alabama. And he didn't think they had but a minute and 34 seconds to do it. I wonder what was going through Gardner Jett's mind, but obviously he was up to it. I think it's important to note, Phil, that the three players who had key roles in this particular game were all walk-ons, three of the players. Certainly, a lot of the scholarship players made great plays throughout the day. But in deciding victory and defeat, three walk-on players made the plays that determined it. Number one, Gardner Jett kicked the extra point that won it. Roger Mitchell blocked the extra point. And then little Bill Newton from Fayette, Alabama, who nobody wanted, walked to Auburn and wound up making what may well be the biggest individual play in Auburn history. And has had to tell the story many, many times. Many, many times. <laughs> I think uh, I think Bill has grown somewhat tired of telling the story. Uh, he wants to get on with his life, but that is a price of fame. <laughs> That's right. You you are so right. Let's get some comments from some of the players now who uh, who were involved in the, that uh, punt, Bama punt game. Sure, we were disappointed to be underdog 16 points going in the Alabama game after the season we had. Uh, but when we, when Coach Davis called a punt play, uh, we realized in the, in the huddle that something was going to happen. The stadium was filled with excitement and tense, tenseness. And as I lined up and broke through the line, I noticed the up back and taking burnage. And uh, the way was open for me to just block the punt. My responsibility on the punt play was to rush from the outside and block the punt. In the end, crashed me out on the outside, and so I was completely behind the punter and out of the play when Bill blocked the ball. And the ball bounced up, and the referee threw the flag, and I went ahead and picked the ball up since it was right in my hands and went across the goal line. And of course, the whistle blew, and there was some confusion. We really didn't know whether it was a touchdown or what the situation was, but it did turn out that it was a touchdown. And on the second punt, the same thing happened primarily. I was pushed out by the end again and went behind, the, went behind the punter, and Bill blocked the ball again, and I picked it up. But this time I really realized that Bill had done a good job and that we were going to have a chance to win the ball game. David, uh, I think a big thing to start of the season, that you remember when we had a team meeting, and Coach Jordan told us in that meeting that he would be proud to take this team to play anybody at any time. And with a man with that much confidence in you, uh, how could you lay him down? Well, Bill, I realized that... Uh, going into that year we didn't have anybody on the team that well even the fans felt like that it was going to be a rebuilding year and everything like that and we just uh, had a lot of people that wanted to play football and wanted to do a lot of things for coach Durden and I think everybody was just proud of everybody on the team and we didn't have any standouts like Pat and Terry and everybody knew that we had to be a team that year to make a good season out of it. Even to this day the odds of the same guy blocking two punts in a row, the same guy returning two punts in a row for touchdowns. Uh, it's hard to believe, David. But it's true. I don't care what the odds are. The only thing that matters is it happened, and those two guys who did it were wearing Auburn orange and Auburn blue. And they, Phil, you know, that game wasn't over when they blocked that second punt and went on top 17-16. to 16. A minute 
and 34 seconds were left. And if you go back and check the record, they ran 12 offensive plays in that last minute and 34 seconds. Only 29 offensive plays have been run in the first 13 minutes of that quarter. And another thing, three times in the last 10 years, Alabama had returned kickoffs on Auburn for touchdowns. Steve Wilson, who was on the kickoff team, remembered one that Ray Ogden had returned in 1964 when he, Wilson, was a kid. And he said, never, not this time. But you know the biggest kick of that game? May well have been David Beverly's punt with all 15, 20 seconds left. Because as Gary Sanders says on the tape of the game, if Auburn can block punts, Alabama can block punts. <laughs> and they were going after David Beverly but that tall, skinny kid from Sweetwater got it all, and uh, they ran two plays, and it was all over. Ah, oh my. Was it ever. Let's take a quick look at the statistics of that game, uh, which will show how meaningless statistics can be. Look at the uh, disparity in Auburn's offenses compared to Alabama's. And yet the final score was one that uh, will always be remembered. 17-16, or punt, Bama punt. It was not one of Auburn's greatest games but it certainly was one of Auburn's greatest pictures. This is Phil Snow with David Housel. Join us again for another of Auburn's greatest games.